Okay, we start chapter eight with electron configurations. This is um, a chapter on the periodic properties of elements. And um, turns out that, of course, well, we've been over this to some extent before, but because of the way the periodic table is laid out, uh, according to the, um, uh, it, what essentially amounts to, according to the electron structure of the atoms, uh, that a lot of the um, elements' properties will vary predictably along with their positions in the periodic table. <clears throat> and what we take from that is that electrons or that um, elements' uh, chemical properties depend quite heavily on the arrangement of electrons in those atoms. <clears throat> so if the arrangement of electrons is periodic, it turns out that a lot of their chemical properties are also uh, periodic. So first of all, the basis of the arrangement of the periodic table is electron configurations. And what we mean by electron configurations is how the electrons occupy orbitals. That is, in other words, how many electrons does the element have? And where are those electrons? You know, which orbitals in which principal uh, energy levels? And are there any vacancies? Are there any principal energy levels that don't have electrons in them? Are there any orbitals within principal uh, energy levels that don't have electrons in them? That can actually be important too. And uh, this is important because electrons are involved in bonding. Basically, bonding is all about electrons. We've gone over to that. We've gone over that to some extent um, already, but we'll go over it in a lot more detail in the future. Believe me. And um, bonding is really all about. You know, it's bonding is what chemistry is all about. Uh, when you combine things together to form new compounds, or you take apart existing compounds, what you're doing is forming or destroying bonds. And so, understanding bonding is really necessary to understand. Uh, chemistry. And in order to understand bonding, you have to or understand electrons. And particularly, you have to understand where they are within a given atom. So the electron configuration <clears throat> what it actually is, is a list of all the electrons in an atom And it tells which principal energy levels or shells they're in. And which orbitals within those shells. And our goal here is to um, basically account for the location of all of the electrons in an atom. Now, as accurately as we can anyway, as we mentioned before, um, because of the uncertainty principle, it's not um, possible to know exactly where an electron in an atom is at any given moment, <clears throat> but we can narrow it down. The, um, you know, we can say that it's in this particular orbital or this particular other orbital doesn't have any electrons in it. And so we'll know certain areas where you're likely to find an electron and certain other areas where you're not likely to find an electron. Okay, so for an example,
the ground state electron configuration is the way uh, ground state just as a bit of a review is the way an atom would normally be found And what that means is it's the lowest energy version of the atom. So uh, the lowest energy positions for electrons are filled. And any vacancies occur only in the highest energy positions. And because this is the lowest energy uh, possible uh, um, electron arrangement for uh, an element, this means it's the lowest energy form of the atom, and it's also the most stable. And this is the way that um, atoms are normally found. So this is basically your normal electron configuration. For hydrogen, the first element, the simplest element, hydrogen has atomic number one, meaning it has one proton and one electron. And so that one electron is normally found in the lowest energy orbital. And that's the s orbital of the lowest energy principal energy level or the lowest energy shell. And that would be n equals one. <clears throat> and the way we write this is as follows. We have a shorthand way of writing it just because saying uh, one electron in the s orbital of the first shell is kind of you know long winded and hard to sort of fit on a bumper sticker, so to speak, um, so that it can be easily and quickly understood. So the way we write it is uh, for one electron for hydrogen would be 1s1. In this uh, electron configuration, the big one at the beginning indicates that the electron is in uh, the first shell. The s tells us the orbital type. And the superscript number tells us the number of electrons in that orbital. So um, essentially, we're saying hydrogen has one electron, and it happens to be in the s type orbital of shell number one. That's what that means. And there will be uh, you know, lots of other elements. Other elements have more electrons. And um, the second electron, if um, say you're doing he uh, helium, which has two electrons, well, you basically just start out the same as you do for hydrogen. And then when you have to add the second electron in, you ask, okay, 
where is the lowest energy position available for another electron at this moment? And the answer would be in the s orbital of shell number one, because if you recall, any given orbital can accommodate a maximum of two electrons. So the second electron would go into the s orbital of shell number one, and that electron configuration would be written as 1s2. And so that would be for helium. And I'll write that down just some. And this way, you can actually build up electron configurations for any element in the periodic table simply by finding out how many electrons it has and then adding them to orbitals until those orbitals are filled and then going to the next lowest energy orbital and filling that up and so on and so on and so on until you run out of electrons. And then you should have your proper, um, you, you know, your proper electron configuration. So as electrons are added for subsequent elements, the new electrons, that is, you know, the electrons beyond what the last element have, go in turn into the lowest energy positions available. This is known as the Aufbau principle. And uh, Aufbau is a German word that just literally means building up. And notice I used the phrase building up a moment ago when I talked about uh, basically building up your electron configuration from the ground up by putting um, electrons in the lowest energy positions available. And when that's filled, you go to the next lowest and the next lowest and the next lowest. It's kind of like piling bricks on top of each other to build a building. You know, you put the first row of bricks in. When you've gone around the perimeter of the building and you've filled up that first row of bricks, then you can put another layer of bricks on and, you know, because that's the next lowest potential energy position. And you go on and on and on. And eventually you build up a building. And a similar idea in chemistry. So you can call it the Aufbau principle if you, um, like to sound, um, you know, really technical and um, highly educated, or you can just call it the building up principle, which is what it's often called also. Um, so helium, like I said, two electrons that would be written as one s two, because the s orbital of the first shell can accommodate two electrons. <clears throat> okay, now before we go on, we have to discuss something that I actually previewed in the last chapter because it didn't really make sense to me to hold it for a new chapter. Um, so I gave you kind of at least a preview or a heads up that it was coming in the last chapter. And so here it is, the fourth quantum number has to do with uh, a property that's called spin for electrons. And we'll cover that in more detail here than we did before. I just sort of wanted to let you know that there was another one coming. Uh, um, a sp spin is a property that electrons have. And it, they're not really spinning literally, but what it does is, it, it's just kind of a name that they gave to it. What it does is it allows two electrons to occupy the same orbital without repelling each other.
this is um, you know important because electrons are negatively charged. Normally, like charges repel each other, and if you try to put them in a small area like an orbital together at the same time, there's normally no way that they would actually stay there. They'd want to get further apart from each other. And so there had, you know, the scientists realized there had to be some sort of quality that allowed them to be together without repelling each other. Apparently, there still is a little bit of repulsion between them, but not as much as you'd expect. And it's the quality of spin that allows you to do that. <clears throat> In order to represent spin, uh, it's helpful to come up with a graphical way of representing electron configurations. Okay, so hydrogen with its 1s orbital, you can rep represent the 1s orbital as a box, or you could represent it sometimes as a circle or just a line in which you draw little stick figures representing the electrons. And the electrons are normally represented as like a little arrow with only half a head on it. And <clears throat> the direction of the arrow represents the direction of spin. So there's two types of spin. Spin up and spin down. Now, of course, you know, up and down don't really make a lot of sense in context with the word spin, but you know, bear with us. It's it's just a qual, you know, it's just a name for a quality. So they're not literally spinning up or down. Okay, so an, an arrow pointed up is spin up, an arrow pointed down, guess what, spin down. Okay, all electrons have the same amount of spin. It's just a question of whether it's spin up or spin down. It's kind of like the, the situation between a proton and electron. They have the same magnitude of charge, but they're opposite in sign. And it's kind of the same deal here with spin. Um, a, an elect, a spin up electron and a spin down have electron both have the same amount of spin, but the up and down uh, sort of cancel each other out so that the electrons don't repel each other. And so in this case, there are only two types of spin. There are no other types of spin possible. It's either up or down. If an electron is alone in an orbital, Spin doesn't always matter. <clears throat> but if you're trying to put two electrons together in the same orbital, then their spins have to be opposite or they will repel each other. So for instance, with helium, where it's got two um, electrons in the 1s orbital, one of them has to be spin up and the other has to be spin down. And it, it doesn't matter which one you draw first. You could draw the spin down one first and the spin up one second, 
uh, it's just conventional to draw the spin up first. Uh, but they do have to be opposite spin or they won't be able to go together. All right, so um, this is the fourth quantum number, as I said. The symbol is M sub S. And the name is spin quantum number. And uh, for some uh, deep mathematical reason that we're not going to go into here, the values are not whole numbers for spin. The values are one half. And that could be plus one half for spin up and minus one half for spin down. And um, like I said, to go together in, in any given orbital, you have to have one of each. You can't have two of them the same. And now that we have uh, all four quantum numbers, we can mention the Pauli exclusion principle. And that is simply that no two electrons in an atom can have the same set of four quantum numbers. or no two electrons in a given atom can have the same set of four quantum numbers. They can have the first three the same. And all that means is that the two electrons are in the same orbital. But when you get to that fourth electron, they've got to be opposite signs or they can't be in the same orbital together. So at least one of the quantum numbers has to be different. Or another way of looking at the Pauli exclusion principle is a full set of four quantum numbers uniquely identifies one particular um, electron in an atom. So if you have two electrons in an atom and all four quantum numbers are the same for those two electrons, something is wrong because that does not happen. <clears throat> if we look here, at the four quantum numbers for the two electrons in helium, N, uh, say for the for the one that's spin up, N is one, first shell, you know, N equals one. L would be zero because that's what corresponds to an S type orbital. M sub L would be zero because M sub L values have to be somewhere between negative L and positive L. So if L is zero, you've only got one choice for M sub L and that's zero. Uh, M sub S. That's the spin quantum number. Spin up is plus one half. The spin down electron for helium is also in shell number one. It's also in the S type orbital of shell number one. It's also in that particular S type orbital of shell number one because there's only one. And it's spin down, so that number is minus one half. So you see the first, in this case, 
since the two electrons are in the same orbital in the same shell, the first three quantum numbers are the same for the two of them, but the last one, that's different. So there has to be at least one difference if you're talking about two different uh, electrons. Okay. All right. Um, Oops. <laughs> okay. <laughs> be back in a moment. Okay. Problem resolved now. Um, that was supposed to be an E before I was so rudely interrupted. Um, the subject of sublevel, uh, which by sublevel we mean orbital type splitting, uh, which is something that occurs in multi electron atoms. Uh, there's a lot of things that are actually different for hydrogen versus the other elements. Hydrogen is nice and simple, although not as simple as you'd think, because it only has that one electron. Once you start adding other electrons in, uh, a lot of interactions start occurring and things that you might not expect crop up, uh, like this sublevel uh, orbital or orbital type splitting. And what that means is that in hydrogen, we, we mentioned at one point that the energy of the orbitals in hydrogen um, is determined by nothing other than the principal quantum number. So um, in hydrogen, of course, in its ground state, it only has one electron. And that one electron is normally found in the s orbital of shell number one. But there are higher energy orbitals in hydrogen that sort of theoretically exist. They're usually empty, but they are there and can accommodate electrons if the um, uh, hydrogen atom absorbs the right amount of energy. Um, so, you know, the, the, uh, that one electron in hydrogen could be promoted to the 2s orbital or even the 2p orbital or the 3d orbital or, you know, any of those orbitals. Um, they're, they're mostly, for the most part, empty, but they can accommodate electrons um, if the atom is, um, becomes excited. Um, but with hydrogen, all of those orbitals, their energy is determined just by the principal quantum number, meaning that in the second shell, where you have hypothetically, for hydrogen at least, um, an s orbital and the p orbitals, the s and p orbitals in shell number two have the same energy. In shell number three for hydrogen, the s, p, and d orbitals in shell number three all have the same energy. It depends only on the principal quantum number. Okay, so that's what I was saying here. In elements with more than one electron, <clears throat> the energy depends on n and the type of the orbital. Okay, so in any given shell, of, uh, in, you know, of an atom, the energies would go like so. S is the lowest energy orbital in any given shell, followed by P, followed by D, followed by F. And so uh, essentially when we're doing electron configurations, when you come to a shell with more types, uh, more than one type of um, orbital present, you would first fill up the P or the S orbital of that shell. And only then would you start adding electrons to the P orbital in that shell. 
And only when that is full would you go on to the Ds and so on and so on and so on. And that's what we mean by splitting the energies. <clears throat> the reasons for the splitting, and this is the most important part right here, it's just knowing the order of energies. The reason for the split is Coulomb's law. That's C-O-U-L-O-M-B, Coulomb's law. And it describes the interactions between charged particles at a distance. And what it does is it calculates the potential energy of uh, two charged particles. Um, and that depends on the charge and their distance from each other. Okay. And so it depends both on the charge on the particles and the distance they are apart from each other. The charges on the particles are called Q1 and Q2, and the, uh, the distance apart is called R. And the equation is E, that is for the potential energy, is one over four pi epsilon sub zero times Q1, Q2 over R. The first part here is actually just a um, constant, although it's written in this form um, because, of course, whenever you write down the value of pi, you're rounding it off to some extent. So they're writing it in this form with, with pi written as pi. So basically, it allows you to be as accurate as you want to be on uh, calculating the number. Epsilon sub zero is also a constant. 8.85 times 10 to the minus 12 square coulombs per joule meter. And if you um, look at the equation, you're taking one charge times the other. So it turns out that the energy is positive for charges of the same sign, whether they're both positive or both negative. And high energy is, you know, remember, generally bad or at least unstable in chemistry. So um, in this case, um, positive energy would indicate some sort, you know, some level of repulsion. And it's negative for char for opposite charges. And that would indicate some level of attraction. And looking at the um, way the equation is set up, you can tell that the equation, that the energy is uh, proportional to one over R, that is inversely proportional to the distance. All right, let's give up on that.
and it's directly proportional to the product of the two charges, Q1 times Q2. So um, for say ch um, charges of the same sign, Q, um, E would be positive, which indicates that they repel each other. Uh, as they move apart though, the repulsion would get less and less because R is increasing. So the magnitude of the repulsion would, they'd still be repelled by each other, but the number would be getting smaller. So, you know, a smaller negative number, basically the absolute value would be getting smaller, which means it would be getting closer to zero. Um, if the opposite, if the charges are opposite, the particles are attracted to each other. Uh, if they were to move apart from each other again, the attraction would decrease because R is getting bigger, so the number would be getting smaller. If R were to get smaller, then the attraction gets stronger. Okay, this causes some shielding of electrons, which we're gonna to have to get to in the next segment of the video because we're a little over the time now. So I'm gonna cut off part A right now and I'll be back in a moment with part B.